one can hear me well yeah uh, look if you can't it's not your fault it's my fault i have to to speak up uh if you are up the back and you can't understand what i'm saying there's 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 no harm in just saying look please speak a little bit louder or uh, speak more clearly. There's no problems there. Uh, before we get into that, I do have to uh, do so. Well, two things quickly. Uh, yes, I work at a at Max Planck Institute. The one I work at is for comparative public law and international law. Uh, yes, I think it's the best research institution for these areas of law in Europe. Um, but I also think it might be the best in the world. So that's the only thing I will, will add. And the second thing is I want to thank uh, particularly Professor Bungenberg for inviting me here. And also there's a lot of other invisible work that you never see. So for example, Alexandra and her, her, her colleague, Stephanie, there's always some emails that have to go between us to, to make sure that I'm here. So I wanted to say thank you for that. Uh, also, thank you to, to you uh, for being here. I wasn't sure uh, who would actually turn up. And I, I thought uh, it could be a, a class where some people have to go because they failed an exam or, or something. Um, so I thought there might be two or three people here. Um, but now I look around and I see there's uh, quite a lot of uh, people here. So thank you for coming. It gives me a lot of uh, encouragement and, and energy to talk about this here, the rise of domestic courts in international investment law. I'm not going to tell you exactly what that means now. Hopefully over the next 30 minutes, we'll, we'll get an idea. But just to give you a, a small idea now, I put this picture here. It's not, it, it, it's not perfect for what I want to portray, but what I want you to think about is, is that International investment law is this big rock here that you that you see. It's the first thing you see, but there's something going on in the background. There's a big, powerful light that's somehow moving, 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 moving up very slowly, and it's going to shine a new light on this big rock here. So that's a bit of the direction we'll be going in. Uh, how do I operate? I suppose I just do press that. No, oh, that's not working. Maybe I need to press that. Yeah, all right then. So we're in business. Um, first, give me about 10 minutes to give you some background so we are all on the same page and then we'll start uh, going into some more details. So question one. What is the meaning of the rise of domestic courts in international investment law? Uh, again, I can't give the answer in five seconds. We need about 30 minutes, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. But perhaps one answer I can give you is this here. It's a thesis of a research project. Now, if I stand or sit in your position, I might be thinking, what is a thesis? Because like, let's be honest, um, I'm older than you, you're a bit younger than me. When I was your age and someone starts talking about the word thesis, I might be thinking, well, what are you talking about? So basically uh, I think of a thesis, it's a little bit out of line, but you get the point. What is a thesis? It's basically, it's a contribution to existing knowledge in a particular scientific field. So what is our scientific field? I mean, what are we thinking about in this classroom here? Anyone? Yeah, yeah international investment law or simply law. So the idea is, is to come along and to say, we, the, the research team, which as we heard earlier, includes uh, Professor Bungenberg, uh, we have found some new information or we have made a new finding in this area, in this particular scientific field. So rise of domestic courts in international investment law is a research project fundamentally. I'm going to talk to you about the research project today. Uh, that didn't quite come out, but sometimes uh, it makes more sense soon. 
these little ticks. Where is this research project at? It could be at different stages. It could be at the conception stage where we are thinking about the idea, but it's gone a little bit beyond that. The tick there, I've got an idea where it should go. The planning stage. So when you're planning something, you're thinking mainly, how do I get money? Fortunately, we have some money. We are at the execution stage. So we're actually you know, trying to read cases and, and doing the, the actual research for the project. And hopefully soon enough, we'll get to completion where there will be a book and with some slight chance, you might even read it. Well, parts of it anyway. So that's the direction where we're going. If I'm sitting in your position, I'd be basically asking this question here. What is your role in this? I mean, why should you care about this research project? Is it going to help you pass your exams at the end of the semester? Probably not. Many of you just click out now. Okay, <laughs> I'm not there. Um, but there's, there's a good reason not to, to click out because what I'm really trying to, to say to you is that are you, are you going to sit there and be an audience and listen to what I think is a really beautiful uh, idea or a, a new interesting finding about international investment law? If you were going to be the audience, you'd probably be so bored after about 10 minutes. So I said to myself, I can't do that to you. I can't make you be an, an audience and just listen to me. What I want you to do, and I hope this part comes off, is to be critical reviewers. So you know that I'm doing a research project. Now I want to present it. And then later I want you to say, I can see a problem here, or I can see a problem there. Now, a quick point. I don't watch Deutschland sucht den Superstar. Um, I can honestly say I've never watched it but I needed a picture from Google to somehow like communicate that you uh, need to sit there and kind of judge me, okay? Uh, this is what Google recommended. So yeah, please don't look at that and think, oh, I'm a big fan of this show because I can, I can promise you I've never watched it. I think, um, what's the translation? Because this show is like the German version of... <laughs> America's Got Talent? American Idol. Oh, American Idol. It's a talent show and you have a, a group of judges. So th that's basically what I want you to do. We're going to work through this together to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. I think we'll start off with a history lesson. Uh, I suspect that throughout history, people have always recognized that states must not mistreat foreign investments. And that's really what international investment law is all about. We're basically trying to understand how can a state treat a foreign investment? Yeah, and there's all these rules on, give me an example. Give me an example of mistreatment in international investment law. What's mistreatment? Yeah. For a foreign investor and giving more uh, uh, favor to their domestic uh, entities or companies. Yeah, so basically saying to local companies, yeah. you get this subsidy, foreign investors, mm, sorry. Another example of mistreatment? Yeah. Uh, expropriation without compensation. Yeah, so taking an investment and not giving any compensation for it is also an example of mistreatment. We've always known that, that states should not mistreat foreign investments. This is my suspicion. I can't prove it exactly. But where there has been change in international investment law is how we go about settling disputes. And I want to go through a progression here. And you're going to help me with this. So first method up there, gunboat diplomacy. Do you know what that's all about? When we talk about gunboat diplomacy in international investment law, your brain says what? What's the image that comes to your mind? 
Are there any images? Does gunboat give you some, some clues? What's a gunboat? Sorry? Yeah, military. So what does, all right, military. I'm talking about mistreatment of foreign investments. We're talking about settling disputes. So we have a situation where an investor does not like what a state has done to it. Okay, and now we talk about gunboat diplomacy to settle the dispute. So what's normally going on here? What happens? Well, the home state of the investor turns up at the host state with one of its gunboats, its military, and basically threatens violence against the host state unless it changes its treatment of the investor. All right, so this is how I think... You know, if you go back 200, 300 years, uh, sometimes disputes between investors and states were settled with gunboats, with, with navies. Does anyone know, after we thought, you know what, settling our legal disputes with violence is not a good way to do it, what was the next step in the process? Sorry? Yeah, we can go for negotiation. There was one idea that particularly came out of South America. It didn't really catch on that well, but I want to mention it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's why that comes a little bit later. Um, I'll give it to you. Equal access to local courts. Uh, has anyone heard of the Calvo Doctrine? Yeah. This morning, yes. Exactly. Calvo doctrine is huge, but there's one part of it, and it's this part of it here. I don't want to have to translate that. If you learned about it this morning, you probably know more about it than me. Equal access to local courts. So basically, the idea is. Rather than the home state, a strong, powerful state turning up with its navy and threatening violence, what we offer to foreign investment, sorry, foreign investors, is the possibility to go to local courts and decide investor state disputes there. So if you have a problem with Germany, what does the idea, if you are an investor and you have a problem with Germany, what does equal access to local courts mean practically? It means what? Yeah. No, uh, like, uh, equal treatment, like uh, the same national foundation, same local entity. Yeah. So we have not uh, like favor, giving favor to the local entities and giving a discrimination to us. Yeah. Or uh, like any kind of inequality. It yeah. The same kind of equal uh, treatment who uh, the national other local companies are getting from the same pools. I agree with everything you said. Uh, but I mean, all right, put yourself in the position of an investor here. You have a problem with Germany. You probably want money for it, okay? And I'm telling you, you have equal access to local courts. What does that mean as regards where you take your claim against Germany? We're not going past this point until you understand it, by the way. Yeah. Perfect. That's the idea of equal access to local courts. You say to foreign investors, you got a problem? Go yeah. down to that court in Zabuken there and complain about it. Yeah. All right, then think more practically. If you are standing in the shoes of the investor, why do you say, I don't like that idea? Theoretically, very good. Practically, why? Because of the language barrier and the same thing, uh, they can favor their local party. Yeah. Yeah, they can favor their local parties. Um, in this case, the state. Yeah. So they'd be the the foreign investor will be thinking, right? I've had a problem with let's just say, who lives in Zabuken here? Well, I mean, you you all do, but who who comes from Zabuken? Anyone? No. Let's say there's an institution called Stad Zabuken. I, I don't know. Maybe there's something different. If you've got a problem with Stad Zabuken, 
and then you have a possibility to go to a local court in Zabuken, you might be feeling like, okay, the people at Stad Zabuken know the judges at the Amskarish Zabuken. I feel uneasy about this. I'm not going to get fair treatment. So what was the next uh, option to, to go for then? Does anyone know what was the next? I love your answers, but I want to spread the love around the room and ask for some other people who are a little bit quieter to, to speak up. Let's hear it. Who's the bravest? Who's going to tell us what happened after this? State to state disputes, gentlemen. What does that mean? I'm going yeah. to nominate my diplomatic missions to go as favor and go for the state. Okay, all right. So basically, the home state takes a claim on behalf of the investor against the host state. Easy enough. Yeah. Host state is, well, sorry, home state takes a claim for its investor. So if your home state is Germany and your investment is in France, that means Germany makes a claim against France. Full stop. Again, what's the practical problem with this? Where's the problem? Who's enforcing the claim? Sorry? Who's enforcing the claim? So you, you're from Germany? Let's say you are. <laughs> you're from Germany. Your home state, Germany, the German government, takes a claim against the French government. Do you see if you have this system in place that perhaps in some situations that Germany will not take a claim for you? Or do you think they will always take a claim if you go to the government and say, yeah? They have diplomatic relations and so they have some priorities and they may uh, take from the claim. Uh, yeah. What happens if your home state says, we don't want to annoy France? You know, we want to do business with France. And if we take your little claim that we don't really care about, then the French government is going to be annoyed with us. Why do we do that? We're not going to do that. Sorry. We, we like you, but for political reasons, we're not doing that. So what's the final progression here? Where do you go? Sorry? So the next step has to be, if it, no, it doesn't work. Well, it does now. Investor State Dispute Settlement, ISDS. Now, uh, this is the one that you should be most familiar with. Um, you got to answer that question. What's the defining feature of ISDS? What is ISDS all about? ISDS is all about yeah, I like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push for, for others to make a contribution here. Who hasn't spoken yet? Anyone? ISDS is all about, starts with a word starting with A. Yeah? Exactly, arbitration. All right, then. That's where we're at. Now I want to go through the basic steps of an investment treaty arbitration. How does an investor go from this point here where they say, I have a problem with my investments mistreatment by the host state to the point where this is not. Uh, now this seems to work to receiving compensation for this mistreatment. I want to know the basic steps to get there. All right, that works. I gave it away, first step. You need to, to make a claim. But here's my question to, for you. How is that possible for an investor to make a claim against a state? What makes it possible? What's the kind of key document that makes it possible? Yeah, yeah you have... 
Good, a bilateral investment treaty. How's that possible? You can think in your own mind, a bilateral investment treaty. Next step in the process is deciding the dispute, all right? Who makes the decision? If you're in arbitration, you, yeah? Yeah, arbitral tribunal makes the decision. Do you need courts to do it? Do courts have to make a decision at some point? Maybe, but do you, well, we're actually going to get to that. Let's hold that. So the next step in the process is getting a remedy. So if the arbitral tribunal makes a decision that you, the investor, should get compensation, the next step is to get the remedy. Um, how is the remedy usually obtained? Do investors ordinarily have to enforce, go to a court and enforce? What's the answer? Yeah, how often are challenges made? Not very often actually, but it's, it's possible and we're going to get to that. It's possible to make a, a challenge. So what I'm trying to get to is this point here. The conclusion is that ISDS is more or less a self-contained system of dispute settlement outside domestic courts. Well, that's, that's the theory because, you know, how do you start an investment treaty arbitration? You know, you, you make a claim using an investment treaty. There's a well-known procedure for that. The arbitral tribunal makes a decision, not the, not the court, and you don't need the court to help you. And then when it comes to getting the remedy, on most occasions, the situation is that the host state will give you the money. So yeah, I, I think we can probably say that ISDS is in theory a self-contained system. Question is, now we have to answer it, can domestic courts become involved in investment treaty arbitrations? I want to look at the different possible ways that a domestic court can become involved. And of course, I'm going to ask you to help me with this. So making a claim, how can a domestic court stop an investor from making a claim? Is that possible? Is there something that a domestic court can do? What can a, 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 sorry, a domestic court do to stop an investor from making a claim? Is there something they have in their arsenal, something they have in their weaponry that they can say, nope, investor, you cannot make a claim? What about an anti-arbitration measure? This is a bit vague. I've kept it a bit vague to make sure that I can ask a question now to see that you know what I'm talking about. So when I talk about an anti-arbitration measure, is there any concepts that are coming to your mind? No? Yeah? Many people have national security or some uh, like really emergency situation. If there's a war situation or something like this, or for their protecting of their sovereignty of the state. Only yeah. in their, that sense, I can, I can see that they have any anti arbitration merit. Um, or this, otherwise, it's very, very tough at this practical level yeah. to stop, uh, uh, to challenge the BIT uh, against with the domestic force. Potentially, yeah, yeah. I was thinking of uh, something else. Has anyone ever heard of an anti arbitration injunction? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Have you studied a little bit of commercial arbitration? Yeah, from the international route from the international court means we can go to domestic court, they pass injunctions, but again, if there's no consent in arbitration, how are you going to be passed? Yeah, so basically this enforcement will be not there. This, well, this option, what, what happens is um, normally the host state would go to a domestic court and say to the domestic court, we want an order telling the investor you cannot participate or cannot, you know, um, go to, to arbitration. 
very simple language. So that's one way they can become involved. Next way, um, retaliatory measures. What we're thinking about here is this situation. Um, you are the investor. You make a claim against the host state. Nothing too difficult there. When the host state finds out that you make this claim, they get really angry. And they think, can we, can we go for an anti-arbitration injunction? And they say, probably not. But they might have some other ways to stop you from making a claim. Does anyone want to take any wild guesses how they might do it? How they might do this and how they do do this? What happens if they arrest you? And they say, you know what? Uh, you've been involved in corruption. And because of your involvement in corruption, uh, we're going to prosecute you. They also might mention to you that, well, we could let this prosecution go if you stop your investment treaty claim against us. So this is another possibility that states have, and some states, not many, but some states take this option. Third possibility, this is a bit more complex. Have you heard about the Ahmir decision yet? Ahmir decision? No? Forget the Ahmir decision for now. Constitutional review. So what, what's going on here is, is that let's imagine that a state signs a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, you are here in, let's say the state is Germany. You might look at that as a citizen and say, you know what, I really don't like that. I think this bilateral investment treaty is awful for the environment. What you could do is take a claim to the German constitutional court and ask them, is this investment treaty compatible with the German constitution? And of course you can do the same thing in, in other countries around the world. So obviously I don't know, I assume, uh, most of you are not from from Germany. Do we have any? Uh, are there any Germans in the room? A couple. One. Um, yeah, but, I mean, do, do we have anyone from France, perhaps? And I thought because we're in Saarbrücken and France is across the board. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could do potentially do the same thing in in any country. You could go to the constitutional court and you could say, look, this investment treaty is in breach of our constitution. That's one way you can potentially stop these claims if you are in the position of the state. What about in the process when the arbitral tribunal is deciding the dispute? How can a domestic court become involved in these situations? Um, here's one thing about arbitration. Um, do arbitral tribunals have compulsory powers? So let's say that you need evidence, all right? Is there the possibility for the arbitral tribunal to say to someone, you must give us that document? Involved, but the arbitral tribunal itself doesn't have that power. It, it, it can't say, look, you, you know, they they cannot issue a document saying you must give us that document. The customer's consent to the investor. Uh, in, the investors do not have a, a, a lift so that they have an arbitration that contract before they go to the PA fees and that we said to any arrival receipt. So what is the implication of so? Yeah. Yeah, of course they have jurisdiction, but do they have the power to actually take a document from someone? No, no absolutely not. How how do you how do you do that? How if you are an arbitral tribunal and you want a document, how can you possibly get that document if you really want it? Yeah. That's another way they can become involved. So helping with evidence is another big way that domestic courts can become in, involved in the process. This one's a little bit more, more complicated, concurrent cases. Um, let's imagine that you're a big, rich investor. 
you have a dispute with the state, you know uh, that I have, well, you as the investor, you have the possibility to take an investment treaty claim against the state. Could you also at the same time make a similar claim before a domestic court? Yes, you can. And that's, well, that's what we call a concurrent case. All right. So when you run two cases at the same time, it doesn't happen that often, but it's happened at least twice, including uh, against Germany. And finally, this is another possibility for how domestic courts become involved. So ordinarily, we think that if, if you are the investor and you think that a state has breached an investment treaty, you go to arbitration. Is it possible, however, for you as the investor to say, no, I will not go to arbitration. I will actually go to a domestic court. I will say that Germany has breached the rule on expropriation and take that claim to a domestic court. Or do you have to go to arbitration? The answer is you can go to domestic courts. I mean, ordinarily, you would go to arbitration. This is what you've been probably learning about the whole time. You're the investor, you have a problem, you go to arbitration. But what we're going to show in this project is that, well, you know what? Um, not all the time. Sometimes investors go to a domestic court and say there is a problem under the treaty or there has been a breach of the treaty. What about getting the remedy? How do or how can domestic courts become involved in this process? This is the part where I think you should be quite comfortable on your own two feet. So we heard about it uh, earlier. What's, what's the possibility for a domestic court to become involved here? It's one of the normal ways they become involved in these cases. How do they get involved? In the enforcement of the award. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Artie. I think, it, were you speaking then? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Thank you. Enforcement or execution. The, the difference, as we've found out recently, is not as clear cut as we thought. But enforcement slash execution, if you want to get the, the money in your bank account and you are the investor and the state won't give it to you, you need to go to the court for enforcement or execution. What about other ways that uh, courts can become involved here? Also asking the people, of course, out in the virtual world, but also in, in this room too. How else are they going to get involved? If you are a state and the arbitral award says you have to pay 50 billion euros in compensation, uh, you're probably not going to want to do it. So what are your options now? What are your options? How do you, you know, fight back here? How are you going to do it? Well, yeah. Yeah, challenge it. You challenge the decision. So that's our next point here. You can challenge it. I want to know about two types of challenges. I mean, you can't just turn up to the court and say, I challenge. You need a reason, of course. So any, any brave souls who want to tell us a, a good reason to challenge an arbitral award? Procedural things. Okay. Uh, if it's not uh, independent arbitrator, not independent impartial. Yeah. That actually, that's actually the second point one. There's, there's one before that I was thinking, you're, you're right, but it's, I know what's coming up in the slides here. The next one is, uh, if you are an arbitral tribunal and you decide when you don't have power, well, they came up at the same time, but anyway, you have no jurisdiction. So that's one of the, the common ways to challenge an arbitral award is to say to the court, the arbitral tribunal made a decision, yet they never had the power to actually do it. Um, the other possibility is, is a little bit more vague uh, against public policy. So you look at the arbitral award and you say in some way, if this arbitral award was enforced by the court, 
it would breach the public policy of the state where the court is found. So those are the ways that courts can become involved. Here's the question that I want to ask. If domestic courts are becoming more involved in investment treaty arbitrations, how is this changing international investment law? That's the whole point of doing the research project. I mean, on the one hand, you know, we have to go through a couple of steps here. First, we have to identify the different types of involvement, like we've just done that then. That's not too difficult. Second step is a little bit more difficult. You have to prove that these involvements are regularly happening. So let's talk about, for example, that situation where a state takes retaliatory measures against an investor for starting an investment treaty claim. If that had happened once in 20 years, is that so interesting? N not really, but we know it's happened at least five times and it's happened four times recently. So that's the, the next step in the, in the process of trying to, to answer this question. And then if you realize that courts are becoming involved, their involvements are substantial or they're happening regularly, then the third step, and this is what, you know, this is where we have to get to soon enough. I'm, I have to admit, I haven't been keeping track of the time so well. Uh, Take whatever time you need. Give me another five, okay? And then we'll, well, I'm hoping that you will contribute at the end. We've spoken about all these different involvements. So this is the really hard part. This is the part where you kind of earn your money. Think about the broader implications of domestic courts becoming involved more regularly. Now, I think that there are quite big implications and that leads to the thesis, which is the rise of domestic courts in international investment law. So I hope it's like coming together for you now. Like we have international investment law. We know about it. We know that there are rules don't expropriate. If you do expropriate, there's the possibility to go to arbitration. And I think everybody in the room is, yep, okay, that, that sounds fair. There's like on the one hand rules. On the other hand, there's this system to make a claim. Now I want to make it more complex and say, there's a third element out here, these domestic courts. And they're, you know, they're starting to um, make their presence felt on international investment law more generally. They're starting to rise. They're starting to flex their muscles, use their power. Let's, let's try and dig into this third step just a, a little bit more. So if courts are ready to conduct constitutional review of investment treaties, uh, is there anyone out there who says, well, that new involvement might change investment law because dot, dot, dot. It's a tough question, by the way. <laughs> Maybe I might go through these ones, finish it up, and then you can offer your thoughts at the end. So this is what you have to do for, for each different type of involvement. You have to ask, all right, courts are now conducting constitutional review. What does that mean more generally for international investment law? What happens if they start issuing more anti-arbitration measures, anti-arbitration injunctions? How does that change international investment law? I mean, superficially, you'd say it probably makes it more difficult, but yeah. Uh, this whole dispute resolution is based on the international treaty. So, with the international uh, complaint, then uh, there will be the process of the constitutional review of this treaty. Then, it's, uh, it will be the hardest to just may open the dispute resolution. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Yeah. Good point. What about these nasty retaliatory measures? Like when, if you are the investor and the host state arrests you, what can the arbitral tribunal do about that? You can think about that question. It's a difficult one. Getting support for obtaining evidence. 
Uh, I have to admit, I'm not sure how that one is going to change international investment law more generally. Uh, but yeah. For me, it's the most supportive, uh, like I want to say this point should be of course for me because domestic courts can be the most uh, involved and uh, you can say in cash in this way to get the speedy trials with a better evidence collection. Yeah. And, uh, and in the final trials also, they can help the arbitration tribunal okay. to get the right evidence. Maybe it's, a fair, it's not an unfair trial with the present evidence, but the domestic court having better evidences to do the same claim in a better way, maybe another way, you know. I hope so. Yeah. That... This is the most strong, I think, the most uh, area which should need more exploration to get the uh, involvement with the uh, like synchronized between domestic courts and arbitration tribunals. That would be a wonderful world. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you should write a blog saying there needs to be more coordination. Yes. Thank you for asking the answer on the question. It's really like a question about the district definition of investment and the test competence of investment and the test they should decide their own jurisdiction. Yeah. They should decide their own competence. If this is, uh, if they have the right, they can even have the power or not. Because this would also be a lot of legal framework and, uh, and also because of international arbitration. So I think that um, we should be against these anti arbitration measures. Because if courts were really the answer to it, we don't have arbitration. This is a very thoughtful answer. Thank you. Uh, th this is quite a, a serious threat to the whole system. Uh, this is this is the, one of the more dangerous ones out there. Thank you. Uh, and again, to the people who are out there online, I see there's 45 of you, which uh, I think is an incredible number. If you have any thoughts out there on this, please share them with us. We're happy to to hear them. Concurrent cases. So this is the situation where you have very rich investor and it says, you know what? I'm so rich that I can take one arbitration and then I can also have a second attempt at the court. I do both. I'm going to do both. Okay. Like when you think about core legal principles, what is wrong with that? When you have some person who says, I have one claim, but I take two shots. Is there some principle out there which you, you know, heard about in perhaps when you did civil procedure law and you say, oh, wait a minute, that's, that's, that's not right. Yeah. Uh, it's the intervention of the jurisdiction of the institution. Because if each institution is answering and the report has this resolution, and then you also claim the course. So it means that uh, on the one jurisdiction, it works to the institution at the same time. Yeah. So, uh, where is the line? Yeah, yeah, that's one aspect. Yeah. Nevis and Idam. Sorry? Nevis and Idam. Oh, okay. Now we're a bit, bit of a bit of Latin. Can you uh, translate or expand on the idea? There should be no two judgments for the same matter because mm -hmm. uh, it's a crazy chaotic situation for yeah. legal insurance. Generally speaking, most legal systems say one claim, one chance. If we have a situation where you can keep trying then of course what happens is the rich parties like these people here say well i failed last year but you know what let's go for a different judge this time and maybe we get lucky um the legal systems can't work like that ordinarily one claim one chance concurrent cases they 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 challenge that idea so what about this one? Investment treaty cases before domestic courts. And again, the complement option. Yeah. Which again, uh, I think, will, uh, can be the very uh, generalized option that we can use domestic courts. Then we are making the treaty on the constitutional level. They can check the legal cases 
yeah. and with the constitution that they are having the something uh, which is complementing their constitution. This is beyond later they are gonna have a problem, whatever they are getting timing. Yeah. And later they have to review with the constitution review point one and with the uh, with the board point with the evidence and and the investment treaty with the domestic courts. If they review, they can have a, you can say better better uh, assessment uh, for for having such kind of treaty. They have a green signal yeah. on national level or international. What about anyone in the virtual world? Any thoughts out there on, on these types of, of cases? Can I actually tell you that my, my colleague did some excellent research on this and found there were 21 cases. Most people, if, if and I think Professor Bungenberg would agree with me, if we spoke to some of the experts in the community and said to them, hey, um, do you think that in, an investor would ever take a claim based on an investment treaty before a domestic court, most would say, what are you talking about? It's, it's all about arbitration. No one goes to domestic courts for, for these things. But like I said, the preliminary research shows there are at least 21 cases. And by the way, none of them are co concurrent cases, which tells you what about the investor. So you have these concurrent cases where big rich investor takes two claims. But these cases here are not concurrent cases. So what does that mean about the investor? Yeah. Any question? Sorry. These concurrent cases. Yeah. What is the, the substantive law the um, uh, investors uh, rely on before domestic court? So do they actually try to apply uh, the case in a kind of secluding way, or is it that they rely on like in button for the concurrent case on uh, domestic law? No, they use investment treaties. Although most of the cases formally use domestic law. So let's say you go to a German court and you use German administrative law. But what the investors ask the court is they say, we want you to interpret German administrative law in accordance with international investment law. So they kind of bring it in like via a, a back door. All right. Now. Uh, yeah, but, but, potentially, yeah. Um, but I want to go back to this point here because I think it's really, really interesting and, and sometimes you, you won't see it. So remember, these concurrent cases are not the same as these cases here. All right, then. Do you know what type of investor is taking these cases? To, what's one of the first rules of international investment law? Which type of investor can take a claim against the host state? What's one of your really fundamental rules of international investment law? We, we, it's all. Can a local company take a claim against its own state, the home state? The general rule, I mean, no, I mean, you can you get around it but a little bit. Sorry, exactly. Only foreign investors can use international investment law. But if you look at these cases here, they are local investors. So what's happening is local investors have a dispute with the state and they think, you know what? If the court uses international investment law, we have a better chance of winning and therefore, they go to the court and they say to the court, we want you to use international investment law. So it's international investment law is, uh, is almost becoming a little bit of domestic uh, investment law as well. It's kind of spreading. It's, it's, it's slow. And we're still doing the research on this. But that's quite interesting that some local investors like what they see, and then they try to convince the court do that for us. Let's keep going. Yeah. We have some concurrent cases. Isn't that a duplication of their court? Like, do we have problems or problems? Okay, but the, the investors involved in this, let's imagine that the company has maybe they have a turnover each year of 100 million 
oh, sorry, 100 billion euros. And one case costs maybe 10 million euros and another case costs another 10 million euros and they could potentially win 2 billion. For them, they probably say, it's worth it. Let's do both. For the little investor, they only have one chance. They've only got the money for one chance. Challenge. Oh, this one's a little bit more. So when you make a challenge saying no jurisdiction, can you give me some more specifics on what well, normally the, the state would, would say? What, 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 what are they going to say there when they say there's no jurisdiction because... What's the legal argument that they make in court? They say the arbitral tribunal did not have jurisdiction because dot, 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 including to the 45 people out there in the virtual world. So give me an example. The arbitral tribunal did not have jurisdiction because... Okay, there was no consent. Yeah. What about another one that you've heard about like in, in arbitration itself? What does the state almost always say at the jurisdiction stage? The arbitral tribunal does not have jurisdiction because dot, 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 there is no... There's no treaty. No treaty, yeah, there's possibly no treaty. Kids are not a member of the same... Yeah. Yeah, what about that one? That one's one of the favorite ones. The investor's investment is not a real investment. And because it's not a real one, you don't have jurisdiction. They go to domestic courts and say exactly the same thing. The arbitral tribunal does not or did not have jurisdiction because there was no investment, okay? Now, pause for a minute right there. And then think to yourself, if domestic courts are going to start making decisions on what an investment is, then in the future, rather than reading arbitral awards about the meaning of investment, we might have to start reading judgments from domestic courts because they make the final determination, particularly in big jurisdictions like France, for example, Switzerland. You know, so this is one of the possibilities that domestic courts might be starting to make law for us. They might be starting to tell us what is an investment. And finally, and I think I need to finish here because if that clock is right, I have gone five minutes over time. No one has fallen asleep yet, although of course out in the virtual world, uh, uh, this, this might be different. Uh, but stay, stay with me here. I got one more point and then I, I, I promise I'll stop. Uh, challenge against public policy. What do you know about this ground of challenge? Some people are always very afraid of this one. Why, why are they afraid? Public policy. I, I love your answers, but I like, I want to hear different voices, public policy. I am, imagine if, I don't know, you're, you're walking outside, okay? You're walking around the university and I'm a stranger to you. I turn up to you and I say, look, don't do that. It's against public policy. You're not allowed to do that. Um, you'd probably be annoyed, which is understandable. But I keep saying to you, it's against public policy. What would you probably say back to me? Sorry? <laughs> what is public policy? Yeah, there were probably some other answers out there, but I did not want to hear them. But anyway, the, you would say to me, what's public policy? And I might say to you, it is exactly what I think it is, which tells you the problem with public policy is it's really vague. And you can potentially say in many situations, this arbitral award is against public policy because dot, dot, dot. It gives judges a lot of power to set aside, cancel, annul arbitral awards, okay? So that's one of the, you know, potential implications in the future that judges will become more ready 
to annul or set aside arbitral awards because they say it's against public policy and they also think public policy is exactly what I think it is. Hopefully it's a little bit more sophisticated than, than that. Um, not too many judges in the world are going to say public policy is exactly what I think it is, but you have to wonder in their mind whether that's actually happening. So look, I'll put a full stop there because I think I've spoken quite a lot and you've also spoken too. So really thank you for, for contributing.